HUC JIR Jewish Language Project's Fall Event Series on Documenting Endangered Jewish Languages, co-sponsored by the USC Kasdan Institute. My name is Sarah Bunin Benor, and I'm the director of the HUC JIR Jewish Language Project. And today, I'm very happy that we're presenting a panel discussion about the Jewish variety of Papiamentu spoken on the Caribbean island of Curacao. We're going to start today with a very brief introduction to Papiamentu by Professor Bart Jacobs. And he's going to focus on the Jewish role in the history of this language. And then we'll go on to a conversation among speakers of the language. So Bart Jacobs is a Dutch researcher affiliated with the Jagiellonian University of Krakow in Poland. He specializes in language contact in general and in Creole languages in particular. And he wrote a wonderful paper in the Journal of Jewish Languages about the Jewish role in the history of Papiamentu. Bart, take it away. Uh, you, you're muted. Thank you so much, Sarah, for the kind introduction. Um, as briefly as possible, as you said about the role of the Curacao and Sephardic uh, Jewish community in the history of Papiamentu, especially in allowing Papiamentu to manifest itself on the ABC Islands, right? ABC Islands stands short for um, Aruba, Bonaire, and Curacao, which is where uh, the, this language is spoken. Linguistically speaking, Papiamentu is what we call a Creole language. Creole languages are very young languages that were born during the colonial period, so that's only a few centuries ago. As a result of the colonial expansion and the subsequent linguistic encounters between Europeans on the one hand and Africans and indigenous people on the other hand, Depending on how one counts, there are around 60 to 100 known Creole languages around the world, including well-known examples such as Jamaican English Creole, Haitian French Creole, or for instance, a Cape Verdean Portuguese Creole. Now within this family of Creole languages, Papiamento is kind of special, and let me explain why. Most Creole languages draw the vast majority of their vocabulary from just one language, which is then typically the dominant colonial language. For instance, vocabulary of Jamaican Creole is drawn almost entirely from English, and indeed English was the dominant colonial language on Jamaica. Similarly, Haitian Creole, most of the vocabulary is from French, and it was France that colonized the island. Same also, for Cape Verdean Creole, 95% roughly of the vocabulary is Portuguese, and the Portuguese were indeed the colonial power on those islands, and so on. Now, the ABC islands were, of course, colonized by the Dutch, and yet Papiamento draws its vocabulary primarily not from Dutch, but rather from two other European languages, namely Spanish and Portuguese. Of course, there's also an important Dutch component in Papiamento, but that component is nowhere near as central to the language as the Spanish and Portuguese elements are, right? So the logical follow-up question here is why on the ABC Islands, Aruba, Bonaire, and Curaçao, was a Creole language able to emerge, a Creole language whose vocabulary is not primarily drawn from the colonial language Dutch, but rather from uh, Spanish and Portuguese. Uh, the specific origins of Papiamento is a controversial issue, an open-ended issue. I'm not going to delve into that too deeply today. But one thing that is clear and that is important today is that the Sephardic Jewish community of the ABC Islands are an important part of the equation. Now, I'm not suggesting that um, that the Sephardic Jews of Curacao that they created Papiamento, but I do think they played a crucial part in allowing Papiamento to settle, so to say, to manifest itself on the island and to really thrive on the islands, right? Um, so let me briefly expand on this. Curacao was colonized by the Dutch West India Company in the late 17th century, second half, 
the 17th century. As is well known, Sephardic Jewish community played a key role subsequently in the social and economic development of Curacao. I would say that they formed a kind of intermediary group between the Dutch elite on the one hand and the rapidly growing working class on the other hand, the working class which consisted of um, mainly Africans and uh, indigenous people. Now, the deeper roots of the Curacao and Sephardic community are extremely diverse and complex. But what is important here in the context of Papiamento is that many of the Sephardim, when they came to Curacao, they were already fluent in both Spanish and Portuguese. In addition, of course, to Hebrew and possibly other languages as well. Uh, we furthermore know for a fact that in the course of the 18th century, Curacao and Sephardim began to adopt Papiamento, interestingly, as an in-group language. In other words, they began to use Papiamento between themselves to communicate amongst themselves. So they were shifting their language at quite an early stage. Now we know this because the very first written attestation of Papiamento from the year 1775 was in fact a letter written by a Sephardic Jew to his Sephardic mistress, 1775. So that's early. And there's also evidence from court cases in the same period that shows that indeed Papiamento was in commonly, increasingly commonly used among the Curacao and Sephardim. Now this should come as no surprise because as mentioned, Papiamento has mainly Spanish and Portuguese voca derived vocabulary and the Sephardim, they were fluent in both those languages. So they would have had very little problems uh, understanding and learning Papiamento. As I previously mentioned, the Sephardic community, they held this kind of highly respected intermediary position, I would say, between the Dutch elite and the rapidly growing working class, right? And so Papiamento, with this mixture of Spanish and Portuguese vocabulary, it would have been the perfect language to navigate between these different social groups, right? Dutch elite, Sephardim, and um, Sephardic middle class, perhaps, and um, working class. So to sum up, I would say that the particular role and nature of the Sephardic Jewish community on Curacao is really crucial to understanding why Papiamento was able to manifest itself on the ABC islands, amidst a Dutch elite and an African Caribbean working class. And not just that, but also to really expand and develop into the vibrant language and marker of identity and local culture that Papiamento is today. Thank you, I'll give the word back to you, Sarah. Thank you so much, Bart. That was a really helpful brief in introduction. I know you could have spoken for hours and uh, I'm sure we all would benefit from hearing more from you. And if people have questions, we'll, we'll be able to get to those at the end. There will be a Q&A session at the end. But now awesome. we're going to turn to our panel uh, led by Professor Neil Jacobs with with two uh, speakers of Papimentu, who Neil will introduce, but I will I'll first introduce Neil. Uh, Neil Jacobs is a professor emeritus at The Ohio State University. He has researched several Jewish languages, including Yiddish, Vienna Jewish German, and Sephardic Jewish Papimentu. Neil, take it away. Unmute. Okay. Hi. Thank you, Sarah, for this opportunity. Thank you for everyone participating. Um, okay. So uh, we're, we're all here today because of the relevance of uh, Sephardic Jewish Papiamentu to the field of Jewish languages. Uh, and uh, so that's great. And, and uh, why it's on the website, you know, among the descriptions of various Jewish languages, etc. cetera. Um, I, sh I should... Uh, uh, say very briefly that I initially came to Sephardic Jewish Papiamento for personal and professional reasons. And I thought, okay, as someone trained in Yiddish linguistics, I'll use the tools of Yiddish linguistics to look at Sephardic Jewish uh, Papiamento speech. And what happened is it, it, it flipped it and it has caused me to gain insights from there that make me want to rethink fundamental issues about the history of Yiddish. I mean, it's, so it's really cool. That's what happens when you research an area. Um, now, 
uh, uh, Papiamento is an incredible success story among Atlantic Creoles in that it's, it's emerged as the language, the language of use in, in all levels, informal and formal, intimate and, and general and education. And it's just, so it's a marvelous success story. Um, but we're focused today on Sephardic Jewish Papiamentu. And um, first of all, it cannot be emphasized enough that uh, I believe that, that, the, uh, that the works of May Henriquez uh, just really made all this possible. Uh, she was not a linguist. It's worth saying, if a linguist does it, you say, okay, that's what linguists do. She was active in so many other areas, uh, you know, in, in sculpting, in cultural activity. She was, uh, but she was involved in the, the uh, Language Standardization Committee, you know, in Curaçao, the FPI. Um, uh, and, uh, but she wrote this book published in 1988 about, uh, it was called Tassino Tassana, uh, like this or like that. And uh, she didn't just list words. And so often, some of the initial works on an area of, of language are lists of words, but she got the dynamics of this. She also got the fact that it's not uniform and there are levels of knowing, of knowledge of the ethnolect. And, uh, oh, thank you, sir. Um, so uh, her work is just, just amazing. And the more I read it, the more I appreciate it. Uh, and so any work in this area uh, owes to her. Now, I need to exit full screen so I can see this note here. Um, then I want to say uh, one quick thing before I introduce uh, Lucille and Heske, and that is that um, the Hebrew words that May Henriquez lists as belonging to, in, in, in important ways, to Sephardic Jewish papiamentu, um, they actually present a problem. And um, like, how did they get there? I got this, I'm making this analogy because of my own research several years ago on Jewish Dutch, mainly Ashkenazic Jewish Dutch. But the problem with Sephardic Jewish Dutch was these were generally people who had not been openly Jewish for 150 years or so, or, um, and um, they reconstructed their Jewishness and their Hebrew. And just very briefly, they hired an Ashkenazic Jewish rabbi from Germany to help them linguistically become Jews again. So he, he, he scratched his chin and said, all right, uh, let me as an Ashkenazic Jew, Ashkenazic Jewish scholar, rabbi, let me think what authentic, quote unquote, authentic Sephardic Hebrew should be like. So the, the Hebrew that the Sephardim of, of Amsterdam downloaded was an Ashkenazic riff on what he thought authentic Sephardic Hebrew should be. And there are little mistakes here and there that are fascinating for linguists uh, in looking at that. So my question is, and so my question here is really inspired by that and by reading Bart Jacob's uh, 2016 paper, uh, is let's, let's ask ourselves the basic fundamental questions again. He asked in 2016, what were these Jews speaking? A field can get you know, hotly polemicized Oh, they were speakers of Spanish. They were speakers of Portuguese. And he just said, all right, let's, you know, finish our coffee, sit down, roll up our sleeves and look at this. And uh, uh, just beautiful argumentation. So it makes me think, okay, what is the source of moving forward? This is an opportunity for research in the future. What is the nature of this Hebrew component in Sephardic Jewish Papiamentu? Where did they get it? Is it, an, is it analogous to the Jews of, of Amsterdam? Um, in the 1600s, uh, was it reconstructed? And then we can say, if so, on what, on the basis of what models of Hebrew, uh, they certainly did things that the, the, the uh, for example, I was looking through the list this morning and the, the holiday of Tisha B'Av, Tisha B'Av in Ashkenazic pronunciation, it's listed as uh, Tishna B'Av, where the Ayin is uh, transliterated or something like that as an N. And you see that certainly you know, frequently, Nib Nibrit, a grammar of Nibrit, right? Ivrit, Hebrew or something. You'll see that. And there are phonetic and historical reasons why. Uh, were they just copying it, being consistent to a known model? Was it something they were uh, carrying along linguistically, orally? And I think this, this is a real, these are challenges and opportunities for, for uh, 
uh, going into the future. They certainly had uses like the word for haham or haham, uh, meaning a rabbi, and it has a slightly specialized you know, usage in, in Curaçao. Um, uh, it shows creativity like hames na pesa, um, mean, meaning like, re- hey, this is really out of bounds. This really doesn't fit, meaning lev- leavened bread at Passover. Um, fascinating stuff. So uh, uh, th- there's a lot of work for, a uh, lot of room for future work. Um, now, let me uh, move over to the introductions. Uh, I, I think it'll work best in terms of time management and all that if we have uh, one person give some responses or impressions or observations and then the other. And I'll, uh, the two people today are Lucio Berry Hassett, who uh, is a known uh, advocate for Papiamento, aside from being known as a poet and a translator. And when I say known as, if you go start YouTubing her, um, you know, like, She's, she's receiving awards for her stuff. It's just, it's marvelous. And uh, uh, just a wonderful advocate for Papiamento uh, as relevant here today. Uh, and the other, the other person giving us uh, input today is Heske Zellermeyer. Um, and Heske uh, happened to be in Columbus, Ohio when I taught a course on Papiamento language and culture. And so she just started hanging around in the class, which is like stumbling onto a gold mine uh, for the, the, cl- the class. You know, I think you had, I think, Heska, I think you missed one or two classes and people felt like, hey, wait, you know, uh, what do you mean? What do you mean you're out of coffee? This is a coffee house. Um, but Heska was almost always there and it was just wonderful. And Heska and Lucille uh, go way back uh, in, in Curaçao, uh, uh, know each other very well. Uh, and Lucille was my Papiamento teacher when I was in Curaçao, and my my conduit to meeting all sorts of Papiamento linguists in the field. So I will start with Lucille and keeping a you know, an eye on the things. I I provided in advance some questions. Lucille uh, has you know sort of prepared some talking points on these, and I'll go in the order that that we had them, and I will ask Heskia more or less uh, the same types of things. So Lucille. Um, do or did Sephardi on Curaçao speak differently at all from general Papiamento speakers in your, in your impressions? In what ways? Around, um, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Around 1954, I was a teenager when having very close and frequent contact with my aunts and my father's cousins, all members of the Sephardic Jewish society. I noticed that they spoke Papiamento a little differently than general Papiamento speakers, and that so did other members of the Sephardic community, most of whom were clients of my mother, a pastry chef. What struck me most at the time were the present participles ending in andu, indu, indu, compared to general Papiamento, ando, and indu, like in Spanish along with some words which did not seem common to me. My mother also used some of these different words occasionally. I later found out that the lady who taught my mother to make these delicious pastries had been working full time for a Jewish family as a pastry chef. Besides, as Meharikis pointed out to me later on, many Sephardic girls went to the same school my mother went to, so she must have heard of that particular way of speaking Papiamento. Some examples, festa compared to fiesta for feast. Frigi, Portuguese for frigir, compared to hasa, Papiamento, meaning to fry. And then again, uh, baking cakes, trajando bolo and not trajando general. Oh, thank you. Um, and again, for those that want to go in and, and sort of look at this in front of, uh, in front of you, uh, you can go after today's panel, you can go to the, the website posting on it, and uh, some of these issues are addressed in, in written form. Um, uh, Lucille, how were you aware of some of these speech differences? I've always been interested in people, in speech, and in texts, so it just caught my attention. The following examples are taken from Tassin of Tassana by Meharikis. The particle Tabata denotes the past tense in general Papiamento. 
Sephardic pavimento used instead of tabata. Taba. Ta denotes the present tense, tabata and a the past and lo the future. Were you at captains today? Sephardic. Butaba seka captain ale? Yes, I was. I was at Rita's, then I went to visit Catherine. Si, mi taba. Mi taba na Rita, kaba mi apasa si ka Catherine. A very old construction in Sephardic Papimento should have, is expressed by mesteriba, plus verb expressing that something had to be done that is not taking place or did not take place. You should not have let the matter come this far. General speech would be So without Mr. Riba. Interesting is also the construction with auxiliary verb via or via plus verb to indicate the conditional tense. In general document we omit the via and via. Okay, here it goes. I would have done it for you, but I heard too late. Lo mi abbia hasie pavo, pero matene muchula. General document speakers would say, Lo mi hasie pavo, pero matene muchula, without the via. Another typical safari construction is por a at the end of a sentence to refer to something that has already been said. They wanted to go on vacation, but they couldn't. Nang kera bay kufakansi pero nanopora, nanopora. After the, the A at the end of the sentence, you are supposed to think back. Mi no pora bay kufakansi, but I could go on vacation. So genuine pakimendo would say, nang kera bay kufakansi pero nanotaba tapor. And for those that, you know, want to go deeper into this, uh, for linguists working there, when the, the issue of tabav among Jews versus tabata in general papiamentu, that of course sets off alarm bells and people start looking, when they're looking at the origins of papiamentu in, it, you know, in itself and, and then it brings you to the Cape Verdean stuff and all sorts of cool stuff. Okay, Lucille, you mentioned your mother sometimes used expre some expressions from Sephardic speech. Uh, mm -hmm. And we're, we're saying now as a non-Jewish speaker of papiamentu, she, yeah. she, she noticed, she sometimes used these, and can you give a couple examples? Yeah, fuku, that luck. And um, fuku malaje, but that is typical for part it. Um, fuku malaje meaning a persistent back luck. And in shoval, dowry, balandran, very antique use, wide and long dress, comfortable for women to wear at home. And sonsaka, skillfully getting a person to say something they know and prefer to hide. Hasi vante, to brag, to show off. Vansa instead of avansa, to progress. And this word is very special. Jeitu, it means so many things like talent, ability, strength, grace, artistic touch, and flair. Okay, um, sorry. Uh, the jeito has been did you, did, did you, Lucille, um, did you find yourself changing your speech consciously or unconsciously when speaking with Sephardim? No, never. Okay. Me, I was born in 1915 when talking to some of us non-Jews, as well as the artists who performed in the place she translated and adapted to Papimento, could use her Sephardic Papimento because she knew that we were familiar with that style and we did not feel the need to change our general way of speaking Papimento as May could easily change her Sephardic style to the general style whenever necessary. Right, yeah, that, that's, I was just gonna say that was very common. You got that too uh, with Jewish Dutch where Jews who had switched from Yiddish to Dutch, Ashkenazic Jews, and would speak Jewish Dutch in word order, in certain words, as soon as non-Jews entered the room, they would just seamlessly flip a switch, a toggle switch, and modify their Dutch, and it was no big deal. Just what no. you did, a type of code switching. Um, let's see. Uh, you mentioned to me something fascinating about tonal differences. This was really cool, so if you wouldn't mind uh, giving that example. 
gets rather complicated to explain verbally, but I'll try. To denote my father, my mother, General Papimento uses mi tata, so with a T of Theodore, mi tata y mi mama. Mi tata, high, low. Mi mama, high, low. Sephardic Papimento for my father, my mother, would be mi papa, lo high, y mi mama, lo high. Again, mi papa, mi mama, lo high. If you hear mi papa lo hai or mi mama lo hai, that is with the Sephardic intonation, these words are pronounced by someone influenced by his or her contact with the Sephardi. We have to take into account that there was close interaction between the Sephardi and other ethnic groups on the island, many of them serving as nannies, chauffeurs, servants, as cooks, coachmen, and gardeners, for instance. Um, I should I should just add a personal note. When Lucille was teaching me Papimento uh, one on one in two thousand five, she's particularly sensitive to to tone and intonation, and she would give me some example. And if I wasn't quite grasping it right away, she gave me the the clear message like, "We're not going anywhere until you get this." Um, <laughs> she's 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 uh, very sensitive to these things, but we all are at some level. But she's consciously sensitive to it, so it's just marvelous to hear about that. Anything you might want to share about your interactions with May Henriquez related to language issues or discussion? From 84 to 94, I had the honor and pleasure of working with May Henriquez on the standardization of the Papimento language of the ABC Islands. We compared notes and criticized the wrong construction of sentences or errors made in the social media. I also accompanied her on her visits to all the people of the Jewish community for interviews. These interviews resulted in her two publications, Tassi Nord Pasada, 88, Loki Akira Pasinia, 1991, which are widely treasured as unique. I learned a hell of a lot <coughs> of the synonyms that May used in the, her books. Uh, her goal was to safeguard, document, and treasure what remained of the Sephardic past in Curaçao so that future generations might get a clearer understanding of the rise and flourishing of this special culture. Chomé would ask, is this typical ours or is it general papiamento? In some instances, the answer would be both because, both because the general speakers have acquired words from the Sephardim and vice versa. When I served as one of Chomé's informants, when she was working on her books, she also revised a play I translated from Spanish into Papimento. And here I learned more about her, her art of translating and of general Papimento, because being a scholar may have a rich vocabulary and being an artist, she creatively adapted her many translations of classic plays to the reality of our society, for instance. Shaw's Pygmalion, where Eliza Doolittle sold flowers. She had our Liza selling peanuts in front of a cinema in Willemstadt, Cinelandia. Now, um, there were a couple spe specific questions to you, Lucio, but I think in terms of, of time constraints, I'll just ask you to be just super brief rather than the, um, uh, the if you, I could say it for you almost, that sometimes Jewish elements entered into the works of some prominent writers or poets. And uh, you might just say their names uh, without us getting into the, into the examples. Okay, um, that's Pierre Laufer and Rizal considered two of the three greater authors in Curaçao. Uh, they are Pierre Laufer, Rizal, and Alice Juliana. Right, and so their stuff, the fact that Jew Jewishism, Sephardicisms, have made it into their, you know, uh, into their pop general papiamento works and stuff is is a note on its own. And then finally, uh, I think we're just going to have to condense this. But just can you tell the name? Tell us the name of the, the the project you're working on and the Sephardic relevance without without going through the whole long answer. I'm sorry. Okay, we describe, we describe in our monolingual dictionary of papiamento the Jewish holidays. 
the sephardic entries belonging to the original corpus. Sephardic papyrus towards the compilers of this dictionary consider that in addition to the Sephardic use, they are also of general use in our language and some others that we simply bring about during a plenary meeting. And I would like to give only three examples. Girandol is a large crystal table chandeliers um, and candelabra with several arms for candles. Um, Krikeche, meaning yes, inklinky is the Jewish word, has many synonyms like weak, unhealthy, ever ailing, and these are Krikeche, Infermiso, Frot, Akchakose. Yeah, these um, okay. remain, they remain typical Sephardic words, but we adopt them and we include them. Right. So these are, you know, what's considered a core core papiamentu for someone doing a lang, you know, a monolingual dictionary. What's considered ethnolectally marked or something, you know, and saying, okay, it's there, but it's it's not part of the. Uh, these are interesting issues, and it's it's an incredible project that they're working on. Um, okay, let us turn now to Heska Zellermeyer, and uh, thank you, Lucille. Heska, hi. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. So um, I'll run by some of these questions, but they were originally written for Lucille um, very early, a long time ago. Uh, but I'll ask you some of them. Um, did do you think that... that oh, wait, Jews you, you want to just introduce Heska really quickly? Oh, did I not say it? Um, I, I did. Well, Hes Heska, I knew in Columbus, Ohio. She's a native speaker of Papiamentu. She... Uh, she lived a lot of her life and education was in the Netherlands, uh, The Hague, right? Yes. Okay. And stuff. Uh, has been in the United States for uh, a number of years and uh, no longer uh, lives in. Pardon me? 55. 55. I wasn't going to say, but here we are. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, um, uh, so Heskia has always had very interesting observations on the Papimentu language in, for our class. And so I want to ask her some of the same things today. Uh, do or did uh, Sephardim and Curacao speak differently from general Papimentu speakers and in what ways? Now, again, you're both removed, unfortunately, longer removed from that on a daily basis. But in another way, it's like you got a frozen time, time stamp of I, I, I have a frozen time, Sam, because I haven't been on the island for so long. Right. But nevertheless, Papiamento remains my emotional language. And mm -hmm. no, I was never aware while younger, in my teenage years, that my Papiamento was different. It wasn't late until later that I realized that my Papiamento was different. And in funny ways, uh, when my firstborn needed something done, my husband said, why did you do it? I said, well, as we say in Papiamento, I am very bake at doing it. And he said, that's not Papiamento, that's Hebrew. So that was number one. Uh, I discovered in Montreal a word that my aunts used and only in my family is used, dorlota, which means to pamper. Until in Montreal, I saw on the pharmacy, laissez nouveau dorloté, and I realized it's French. So, uh, and, and some of my aunts really used the old Sephardic traditions. Uh, if I wasn't speaking to a, a friend anymore, uh, it was very common for us to say, what, you caught a cria with her? Did you rip your clothes because the person died? You don't talk to them anymore. And then, of course, the O ending versus the O ending. This morning, I had an interesting conversation with a dear friend of mine who grew up in a bilingual house. Her mother spoke Spanish to the kids. And I thought her father, being a Sephardic Jew, spoke Papiamento to them. So I said, what do you say, landando or landando, swimming? And she said, do. I said, but that must be because of your father. She said, no, my father only spoke Dutch to us. 
So it must have been from you because I learned Papiamento from you. So that was an interesting twist of events. Uh, my aunts, when I, if, if I was abulently happy, my aunt would say, boy, you're happy like Purim. And to me, it was, it was a natural thing. So I know, I never, I never noticed. Now that I'm more aware of it, and, and when I worked with both Pierre and Lucille in seeing that my orthography, orthographia of Papiamento was correct when publishing, uh, I realized that the Papiamento that they wanted to change mine into was not my Papiamento the way they spoke it. So, no. Um, actually, I'm in looking, uh, the questions that I had, you know, the list of questions that I created with Lucille uh, several months ago, um, don't apply. You've answered many of the things just in what you've said. Uh, what you represent here is kind of the same kind of, the same kind of, way I was naive about my English growing up in the United States, several generations Californian, and, and only discovering later, what do you mean? Everybody doesn't say that? Or, you know, like, uh, and I, I just wasn't aware that that was Jewish English in certain ways. So, if, no, so obviously, after the fact, I'm aware of it. And obviously, after the fact, you're aware of it as regards Papiamento. But uh, that's valuable to know. But it, there are little things like, I learned as an adult now more involved with the Hebrew language. Uh, when somebody turned 70 in the family, they became zikena. Zikena is the zikenim, the, the older people in Hebrew. Sure. So those, uh, but to me, one of the cutest ones is the, the local mother whose kid is poking their nose, who says, what are you looking for chametz? What is kamra chametz? That to me is 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 one of the the Sephardic, I guess, influences on Papiamento that always brings a smile to my face. And of course, if something breaks anywhere, that's people say Beshimanto, it means good luck to you, you broke it. And it's Besimantov. Uh, those are the typical uh, aspects. Now Lucille said a few things. I in the family did not say taba. My family said Tabata, and we would say Loma Via Bai. We would not have said Bia, and uh, we would have said Per uh, Minopora in answer, continuing. Uh, at the other hand, other words like Fuku Balaje was Mal never used in my. Sorry, Lucille? Malaje. Malaji was not used in my family. In Dasina, in Dasina, Potasana by me. Yeah, I know, but it's not used in my family. Right. But the tabak business is also very old, of course. I think right. perhaps not your mother, but perhaps the grandmother. No, because my mother would not have changed the papiamento in, in during the course of her life. So what we see what we're seeing here is that ethnolects are not monolithic. And, you know, so, right, if the, it's like, hey, no, we just didn't keep coriander in our spice rack. You know, we just, we don't have salt in our home or whatever. We just don't, uh, we didn't say taba. I mean, and yes, but according to the list, you're supposed to. Well, you know, it's language is not monolithic and communities are not no, But monolithic. I also think that the, the, it depended on what influence uh, there were families that spoke Papiamento and Spanish, or Papiamento and something else. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, must have influenced the differences between the families as well. Right. And one of the things I, I'd like to add in here is that in talking with, with uh, Papiamento scholars back in 2005 and so and, and in the literature, you read about the, le the, the, the different type of multilingualism traditionally found among Curaçao Sephardim versus the multilingualism found among non-Jew, and, and that, that plays a role too. I mean, all this, you know, creates a, a slight variation in the types of soup that you have, linguistic soup. Um, okay, uh, are there any, any other things before? I think at this point we might start uh, drifting over to the, the, a general uh, group discussion, um, but- 
Yeah, that would be great. And, and I actually want to start it off with a, a little question about documentation. Uh, this panel, I think, has been great in documenting some of these phenomena. Obviously, there, there are uh, many more are documented in May Henriquez's book that, uh, that Neil and uh, Lucille have been talking about. And I put that title in the chat, and you can also see it on the uh, Papimentu page on the Jewish language website. And, but my question is, uh, are the interviews, uh, I guess this is a question for Lucille, uh, are May's interviews recorded and can we access those and make them available online? We have to investigate that. I don't know, they have been recorded, but I don't know if the recordings are there still. You have to find out. Okay, well, let's do it. <laughs> let's find out. And if they are available, let's make them available through one of these wonderful uh, language documentation groups like Wikitongues or uh, the Endangered Language Alliance. You know, they can, they can make these recordings available online and then we can uh, make them available to the world. Uh, so let's see, let's ask Bart, do you have any comments or questions? Me? No, for Bart. Bart. Oh, uh, you're muted, Bart. So. <laughs> I'm muted. Yeah, that was fascinating. It was really awesome to hear both Lucille and Heske give actual examples of the way in which uh, the, the ethnolect differed or differs, or differed, I would say, past tense, differed from, from a standard document. So yeah, one question is, is, is there really no chance whatsoever that, that, that there are still people um, around who speak the ethnolect, the Sephardic Jewish ethnolect? I don't think so. Because most of them are there, but, but you know, you there's to... just a remnant left, Bart. We've lost, we've so lost mm. that generation. They're, they're, when I go to Curacao now, I visit oh, yeah, them. Yeah, you, you, of course, Heska, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love the painting in the background, Heska. It <laughs> reminds me, <laughs> reminds me of, a, of, of, I think, an, an, a building on, in, in Curacao. Could that be? Or? Yes, Is sir. It, oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, precisely, is it? Is it a it Sephardic is, it Jewish? It is a Hagedorn. It is a Hagedorn of the Octagon. And if you look at this and you see that little door, that's me before I was a year old in the, at that same building. Wow. It was part of my grandparents' house, and I grew up there. And that's where my wow. document came from. Okay, um, so it was just a lucky guess on my part. Yes, it was. Okay, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. Neil, yeah. I, I was going to say, um, there's a lot of interest in sociolinguistics today on terms like uh, enregistrement, indexicality, and all that. So basically, what kind of buzzwords you use to gain entry to a group linguistically and stuff. And uh, uh, I um, remember from the interviews in Curacao in 2005, we had a generation of people, Lucille, they, they were often in the homes we were in, there were some older people, but there, I remember in the homes of people in their early 40s, late 30s, early 40s, stuff like that, I think. And I'm, I'm, I'm saying, hey, here are, some, uh, here are some things from May Henriquez's book and stuff. And they'd say, without emotional attachment, I recognize this, I don't, or my parents use this word, I don't, and stuff. But then... I remember the reaction when I got to the, uh, you know, Minopora, right, and stuff, and that rang a bell. That was like, right, it, 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 it meant something. Um, and uh, uh, certain things have a certain value above and beyond, well, how much, how many, how many points do you get for this, this word or this grammatical ins instruction? There, there were things that still signal just, you know, just like in the sociolinguistic work on, on Pittsburghese and what types of linguistic features were used to say, hey, I'm really from there, or what signals a certain type of American English in general to theirs. So uh, uh, there was still, even as the ethnolect has waned, uh, 
there remain sort of emotional reactions to, to certain features. They're still there. And not just at the cliche-ish level of, oh, say this, push a button. Um, and, uh, I, I, you know, I, I, found, I found that there was, there was a, a continued connection to some of that. Um, and anyone that has any thoughts on that, that's fine. Anyone want to bring up of the panelists something that you want to say about, about um, language? Did you, did, how did people talk as kids? Did kids ever give, in, in, when you were 12 and 13 and stuff, and you were alone, did you ever, I don't want to say mimic, because that's loaded, but talk the way the other groups did? Um, uh, you know, it's like you're talking now like people from outside of Willemstadt. I'm talking now like Jews. I'm talking like old rich people, young rich people, whatever, poor people. Oh. Yeah. Or language game. Anything, Neil, if anything, the Curacao and the Bonaire and the Aruba uh, Papiamento speakers would mimic the sing song of their language, oh. but that you were Sephardic Papiamento speaker or a Banda Bo or Banda Riba uh, Papiamento speaker. Not that I know of. Lucille, you? No, no, no. O only to, to give an instance of how things are, of course, but not. Yeah. not not uh, to, how you mm -hmm. no, you're talking about the O and the U ending. No, 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 no. If we just say, yes, uh, the Arubans say the handle, and we, we say U more. Or it, the general fundamental, and especially the. the no, but there, between the Aruba and the Bonaire, it's more the sing song of the language. Uh, yeah, yeah, the sing song, but also the ending of the O. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why but, and we say but Lucille, to be very honest, I didn't know that my papiamento was different from the general population until you pointed it out. <laughs> no, I know. And that is for me very, very strange because I was yep. very young when I noticed that. Yeah. Uh, so I, just, I, I want to just introduce some special guests who are here. Uh, I'm going to spotlight them now. Uh, here we have some cousins of uh, some of the speakers. Uh, we have uh, <laughs> Nicole and Diane, who are daughters of May Henriquez, and Michelle, her granddaughter. So uh, we have some oh. honored guests with us today. And thank you for your mother and grandmother's work uh, that has contributed so much to our understanding of Sephardic Jewish papimentu. Uh, so I want to open it up now to questions from the audience. So if anybody has any questions, you can just put them in the chat and then we will, we will say them. And in the meantime, if other panelists have other uh, there, comments. Yeah. yeah, Bart, go ahead. There, there's a work by uh, uh, Percy or Percy, Percy Cohen Henriquez from 1934. It's called The Tal van Curaçao. It's actually an article I see. And it has some observations also on uh, Sephardic Jewish papiamento, or at least on the papiamento yeah. spoken in the Punda area versus the papiamento spoken in, um, in Willemstad. I was wondering just if, if Cohen, Percy Cohen Enriquez was possibly, I mean, the last name is not, not really a, a reliable thing to go by, but was it family, was he family of uh, May Enriquez? Percy Cohen, and does, do you know the, the contribution? Perhaps there's more to find in older linguistic literature from the late 19th, early 20th century with regards to Sephardic papiamento. I don't know because, yeah. Um, Percy, Percy. Is Diane still there? Yes, yes, I am. Diane, you, I said that in papiamento. <laughs> No, no, he wasn't. No. I was not. Not um, even a cousin of my dad's. He wasn't. No. He was a weird fellow that I do remember. Interesting <laughs> fellow. Um, listen, there's a there's a, a question that popped up and it's addressed to Bart. Uh, and uh, it says in the chat, 
Uh, thank you, Bart. Can you tell us more about the 1775 document you mentioned earlier? You said it was the first documentation of Papiamentu, uh, actually not the very first, but the first extended thing. And what alphabet was it written in? So Bart, go for it. Yeah, this, this was uh, written in standard alphabet. Uh, the, uh, the most interesting thing I can say about it, it was a love letter. The most interesting thing about it is that we found only half of it. So the other half is still missing. So that, that's something, I mean, I personally have not had the time or the opportunity to pursue this, but um, this is something that would be absolutely huge if, we, if someone would be able to find the other half of the letter. Um, so it was a, was a love letter um, written by a Sephardic Jew to uh, direct it to his mistress. And there's some interesting, not, not, there's some interesting linguistic details in there. For instance, the use of habla instead of uh, papia. Um, but in general, it's, it's fascinating how closely it resembles modern day Papiamentu already. So this is from 1775. But this tells us that by that time, that's uh, more than two centuries ago, Papiamentu had already sort of stabilized, I would say. And uh, that's, that's uh, in itself a very interesting observation, I think. And, and Bart, when you said it was written in the standard alphabet, you mean Latin characters, right? Yeah, la yeah, absolutely. Latin alphabet. Yes, exactly. No, do, uh, do we have any examples of uh, Papimentu written in the Hebrew alphabet? No, not that I know of. Okay, so it, it aligns with other modern Jewish languages that were uh, created in, in the modern period that do not generally have examples of Hebrew letter script. Uh, there's you know, also, yeah. Consider you have to consider one thing, and I'm not a, a scientist or a sociologist or anything, but those Jews who came to Curacao, had they been the ones to write only in Hebrew, they would not have left the community to go all the way to Curacao, where they didn't know they, whether they would find a minion to continue with their, their prayers or their, their traditions. It so happened the Jewish community grew and that's how the influence on Papiamento grew. But those were not necessarily the people like the Yiddishists who would write the new Creole language in the Hebrew alphabet. That's, um, that would be my non-scientific non reaction to your question. There's a, if I can jump in, there's a whole world of discussion on all this. It is so political. And not in the bad sense, it just, it, you know, in the fact, it's, it's so political, there's so much involved. Um, I, again, uh, we can look at who were these people and were they Jews like the ones who came to Amsterdam and, and came out of, uh, into the open in 1602? Were they Jews who had not been Jews for a hundred and more years and stuff? What did all that mean? Um, culturally, you go to the oldest Jewish cemetery in the Netherlands, in Beit Chaim, in Awaker, um, and you go there, and as a Jew, when you go to that cemetery, it's amazing because they have images of the humans who are buried there. And when you go on a tour of the cemetery, the, the piece de resistance at the end, right, was going through all these Jewish grave markers with, you know, faces and statuettes and stuff of the deceased until finally you're taken to, drum roll, you're taken to a, 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 a grave site with a, a statue of God. And God has a beard flowing in this direction, and you know, because they were Catholics for, you know, well over a century, and culturally this was part of it. And historically Jewish, you say, how can this be? And uh, it's it's yes, there's one. Neil, it was a Sephardic thing. The Sephardim weren't against right. images on their tombstone. Right. Right. Okay, well, well, but would they put images of God? In which case, I stand corrected, but. That, that's what uh, struck at me is angels and God. Uh, it, yeah. Okay, okay. Then, then I stand corrected. Um, it, is that, against, I mean, it is against the Ten Commandments. You shall, you shall not make an image of me. Okay. Uh, then, then maybe, it, maybe then, then, I, then I stand corrected. Um, but as far as alphabet, the political nature of it is is not trivial. In in the hist in the study of Jewish Dutch, uh, in 1803. There was a book published in, in the Netherlands uh, called the Yotz Abe Book, 
And it was the Jewish ABC book, and it was saying, okay, Jews, we've got to switch over to the Latin alphabet. But it wasn't just but that. You can't compare Holland to Curacao. Pardon me? You cannot me? compare. Oh, you but cannot no, but what I'm saying is, I'm, I'm just giving a, I'm, no, I'm, I'm yeah. saying, but culturally, because um, I've examined the contents of that book, and among the things they're saying, uh, they're giving, they're, it's a reader for kids, say, teaching Jewish kids to be facile in, in 1803, in the transition to reading the Latin letters as their basic, you know, alphabet to read in, but it included all sorts of culturally interesting information uh, about assimilation. And one of the sentences I remember was, uh, uh, swimming is very healthy, and in times of danger, it, it can help you uh, get across a river, right? Which is quite interesting. It's, it's, it was, you know, you sort of stop for a minute and think about it. So the questions of what language was this or what alphabet was this love letter written in are actually more interesting than at first glance. Okay, what, what, no, uh, because- It's also interesting you mentioned the, the cemetery, Beth Haim, which there's one with, that goes by the same name on Curacao, right? right? The study was done, done on the grave, uh, gravestones uh, of, of the cemetery. But I'm not convinced that the study was, was I mean, it was done by, by Matthias Perro, a German, and, and Sidney Jobert, if I pronounce mm -hmm. it correctly. I'm not sure if Jobert himself has uh, Sephardic roots or had Sephardic roots, or, did, or if, he, if he even knew Hebrew, because uh, did, he know, did, did he know Hebrew? Because a bunch of those uh, gravestones are actually in Hebrew. But but if you don't if you don't know the the Hebrew alphabet, you're not gonna know if it's perhaps papiamento that they were trying to. Uh, uh, Neil, anyway. coming back on a on a, on a former uh, mention that you made in Curacao, my mother's ancestor, uh, he has a boost of himself on the cemetery, Mr. Capriles okay. himself. Okay, so maybe it's just, yeah, well, I mean, it was, it was, it was clearly Sephardic, the one in the There are tons the of, of the, the cemetery, the tombstones yeah. that have right. re, re, uh, replicas of angels. But anyway, continue but what with stood the out was, What stood out was representation of God, not of the individuals. But anyway, that's how the guide, the guide presented it to us, that individuals, that's very common or whatever, but, but the, the, the representation of God in in human form, but that's, that's, okay, that leads us too far. So, yeah, I, I think we have time for one more question. There were a few people who had questions. So I'm going to spotlight uh, Ramon Todd Dondare. Let's see. So do you, please ask your question. Thank you very much from Aruba. Oh, hi. My question is uh, uh, for Bart. Isn't it possible, Bart, that Taba is just uh, a form in Papiamento of the, let's say, the first phase of Papiamento, because we have the same form in, in Cabo Verdiano as well. And, and, and uh, it is possible that it's just a, a first phase of uh, the form in, uh, in Papiamento. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, that's what, what happens in dialects. If you compare uh, Flemish with, with uh, standard Dutch, you're also going to find archaisms in Flemish or, or words that to us, to touch people, sound like archaisms. So yeah, absolutely. I agree that Taba is a good example. It can't just be an archaism that was mm -hmm. preserved in the Sephardic Jewish dialect, but uh, went out of use in the in the standard document. But you still have Tabatim, huh? for instance, Tabatim. So there's still a short form of Taba in, the, in, in, some, in some contexts, yeah. But so yeah, that's a great point, uh, Ramon. Yeah. Which which means in, in okay. I can talk, which means that people just by by listing out and counting up linguistic features alone, that doesn't tell the whole story. We need to also say that okay, this group in this case, Sephardic Jews in Curacao, have sort of latched onto that feature as a salient marker, and it's not only a matter of listing out the features, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry, um, I would like to ask you, Sil, um, how is uh, the form used at the moment? Are, are uh, uh, the Sephardic Jews in Curacao still using Taba and not Tabata? You mean the Sephardim in Curacao? I mean the Sephardic Jews in Curacao at this moment oh, in no, history. Not, not anymore, no, no, no. That, that's, that's, that belongs to the past. Like, yeah. 
to to not even show me i think not even me have did that and and <laughs> certainly not the children and grandchildren that that belongs to the past the remote past i would say yeah thank you okay. thank you Lucy. well thank, thank you. you thank you thank to you. everyone uh this was a wonderful wonderful conversation and i'm so glad that we have it recorded we will put it up on the website and I just want to thank Neil Jacobs for the idea for this panel and for his work in organizing it. And I want to thank Hannah Pressman for her help in publicizing it. And I want to thank all of the panelists, Neil, Heske, Lucille, and Bart for your wonderful contributions. And I also want to point you to the upcoming events that the Jewish Language Project has. And uh, you can find these, I'm going to put the link in the chat and you uh, can register on that page. We have an event coming up next Sunday, a gala celebrating the documentation of endangered Jewish languages, which benefits WikiTongues and the Living Tongues Institute, who are collaborating on this amazing project to document endangered Jewish languages. And then in November, we have a panel about the work to do that documentation about the practical, ethical, and cultural issues that arise when we document these languages. And then uh, in December, we turn our spotlight to Ladino, and we look at the documentation and revitalization efforts in language, music, and folklore of Ladino with a, a very large panel, including uh, Rachel amato Bornick, who is with us today. And uh, we are just so happy that, that, you're, that you've joined us for these events and we look forward to seeing you at future events. And if you are happy with what you've seen, please do consider giving a contribution to the Jewish Language Project so that we can continue to offer these programs. Thank you so much for coming, everybody. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.